out that his eyes were starting to roll to the back of his head. And I was like sitting next to your eye Faber like, whoa, what the fuck? Oh my God, that was crazy. It's Alex Wendling here. And today I want to talk about some of the hottest prospects coming out of Uriah Faber's A1 combat. They had their sixth event. And this time it was in LA Commerce Casino. Uriah Faber was there. Hey, I'm trying to shoot something. Stop barking. Of course, my dogs want to start barking right as I start recording something, but A1 Combat, great production, great commentary. The voice of champions, Jim Cooley Crab, is so uh, knowledgeable, obviously, about the sport. He's been doing this for so long, but he also runs A1 Combat, so people are always coming up to him, asking questions on where they should be, so he's not only the head main commentator, but he's also running the logistics of the show alongside his co-commentator and the matchmaker, Chad. So I want to skip to the prelim match that I was surprised was even on the prelims because Sunny Inoptep, Inoptep, I'm going to have to get the pronunciation from my friend Emily who goes to Black House. Uh, he killed it in his prelim card. He's fought for Bellator before. He fights, or he's from the Northern Virginia area. You saw Luke Thomas post about him, congratulating him. So I guess they're friends. Um, but he was going up against Armando Vasquez and Man, Armando was kind of doing a little taunting, like, come on, come on. And Sonny was not falling for the bait. He did not press any more than he needed to or expend any extra energy. He just played his game plan, got an easy double leg takedown and was dominant on top. And then ends up getting a vicious TKO knockout where Armando was literally on the ground for probably a minute or two just getting back to reality because he was so knocked out that his eyes were starting to roll to the back of his head and i was like sitting next to your eye faber like whoa what the fuck oh my god that was crazy uh great show out by sunny in Opdep. definitely someone that you have to keep an eye out while he's competing in the regional scene and someone i thought deserved to be on the actual broadcast and not just the prelims but i'm sure there was some reasons why I guess there are some perks of fighting on the prelims because you get it out of the way can enjoy the rest of your night so we go to the main card that started at 7 p.m. was streaming on UFC Fight Pass the first fight was between Callum Callum Parker versus Matt Hampton and Callum Parker had this very boxing heavy fighting style out of San Diego and he was consistently laying down a heavy volume on Matt Hampton but I was cage side and saw some of the hits that Matt Hampton was getting against uh, Callum Parker and there were vicious elbows that I was honestly surprised Parker was able to walk through um, because they were like right on the button, right on the jaw and he was just like, whoo, whoo, keep going. It was like two zombies just like never dying from all the punches and uh, kicks and body kicks that were thrown. So definitely Matt Hampton's strength I noticed was his liver kicks and his body kicks, they were leaving marks on Callum Parker. And it was a, an impressive showing. It went to the decision. So I would love to see the stats on this. Uh, I would love to see the stats on this fight because it just felt like they were the most high volume out of all the fights that we saw. And Callum Parker is representing San Diego in Alliance Gym. So you know he has a lot of tra great training partners back there. And he won by unanimous decision, even though I thought it could have been a split decision. Then we go to the next fight with David Douglas, who is eight and 10 against Eugene Correa, who is two and two. This is a catchweight bout at 160 pounds. And David Douglas is about 40 years old. So a little late in age. And Eugene Correa is uh, early on in his career. This one was such an awkward, but very hype type of finish because Eugene Correa literally comes in and does some type of like flying awkward kick and ends up awkwardly landing on his back. I still at this point watching it back, I'm not sure if he did that on purpose or if it was an accident and he just ended up going for his legs because he fell on his back. But he ends up diving for David Tarzan Douglas's legs and ends up reaping over and getting the heel hook finish within the first 20 seconds. Frank Trigg calls it off. You can see David Douglas Tarzan holding onto his knee because apparently it popped a few times. So hopefully he's okay, but that heel hook was nasty. And it was a very great showing from Eugene Conquistador Correa. But man, I still, if you guys can go back and watch on UFC Fight Pass, this like 
first exchange of the kick. Let me know if you think that was intentional. Like, do you think he was planning in his practice? Like, hey man, I'm gonna fake this kick, fall on my back and go for his leg. Like instead of Iminari rolling that everyone will see coming, let me just fall awkwardly onto my back and go for a heel hook. So very fun stuff there. Always fun when in MMA when you get leg lock submissions. And I feel at this professional level, it happens more often. Like you don't really see it so much in the UFC. So then we go on to our next fight, which is between Musa Tolliver versus Brady Huang. So there was supposed to be another fight before this. It was supposed to be between Shakita Woods, her professional debut, and Jackie Cataline. But um, it got scratched, which I was so bummed about because it was the only female fight on the card. Uh, so hopefully they get to run that back at A1 Combat's next event, but I think they're not gonna have another event until February. And who knows if it'll be in LA, um, so we'll see. And Musa Tolliver is nine and 11. He is a bantamweight fighting against Brady Huang. And I got to talk to Emily, who is the Black House media camera person, and she trains herself. She told me that Brady Huang was knocked out in his last fight. So in the locker room, in the corner, they were, he was a little bit in his head. He was a little bit skeptical going out there, but he was trying to hide it coming out. And I think that's so cool that uh, that fighters feel like this and they just like completely try to mask it. Um, and I think we saw that a little bit in the beginning in the beginning round for Brady Huang. He was getting taken down at will in the corner of Musa Tolliver was just constantly saying, work off that jab, work off that jab, go for the takedown. And Brady Huang was not really sprawling on the takedowns. He was getting taken down at will and he wasn't getting too many looks off of his back. He was definitely hunting for a triangle or arm bar, but I don't know. I, I don't know if it was just the hip mobility or being pressed up on the on the fence, which made it impossible for him to get a submission from there, but it was not looking good for him in the first round. Then we get to the second round and oh my goodness, I got a nice clip of it uh, when I was cage side. He ends up diving for another uh, leg lock and gets the heel hook submission that he really needed because the fight was not going his way. It was definitely a 10-9 round one for Musa Tolliver, but Brady Huang got it done and he improves his score or he improves his record to 12 and four after a heel hook submission victory over Musa Tolliver, who was dominating in the wrestling department. All right, then we move to Trevor Wells in the blue corner versus David Duran, a fight that played out majority on the feet. It was a very cordial fight, like between rounds, they were, you know, fist bumping each other. Um, and this was a very boxing heavy fight from Trevor Wells, who trains out of Temecula with Ashley Yoder. And Wells was having some takedown attempts uh, with not a lot of success. And I think this fight played out on the feet and was not nearly as high volume as the fight that we saw earlier in the day, which was Calum, Callum Parker versus Matt Hampton. But still a very fun fight. It ends up going to this, the decision and Wells wins by decisions. So then we go to the next one between Bruno Ferreira versus Miguel Jacob at the welterweight bout. Man, uh, another Black House another Black House member. He's actually a coach at Black House and he's six and two. I felt the energy for this one. I could tell that Bruno was also feeling the energy because when he was standing up against Miguel, I saw in his face, he was a little bit nervous, like that deer in headlights look. And Miguel Jacob right out the back has a nasty calf kick. And you could hear it like through the whole crowd. Like I was sitting cage side, but I know someone in the way back could have heard that kick. And I was like, oh shit, this guy has some gnarly kicks. So I was like, I don't know if this fight is gonna last the full the full three rounds because he's just kicking so hard it feels like there could be a knockout so miguel jacob kicks right off the back super art um audible bruno wallace is looking a little bit stiff and his faint game was very uh jolty it wasn't like he was actually pretending like he would go in for a kick or a punch or anything like that felt a little bit robotic felt like Maybe he didn't get enough of a warm up in. It's two Brazilians battling it out on the feet. Miguel is definitely the aggressor in that first round. 
vicious knees on the fence with two minutes and 35 seconds left. And then the fight ends with Miguel Jacobs calf kick that ends in a technical knockout. Bruno cannot continue anymore and he wins that and he ends up getting the thousand dollar bonus for performance of the night. So congratulations to him. Then we move on to Eddie Bernal's professional debut. I've done a lot of coverage at, of him at True Promotions when he went undefeated. Um, and he's going up against Subfighters Chase Whitmer, who is 1-0 in his professional career. He is fighting at a Subfighter in Orange County. And those Subfighter guys, they don't fuck around. Mo is someone that trains there. I, fought, um, I interviewed him at Lights Out when he won. Blake Builder has obviously worked his way up. He was a champion of CFFC, went to Dana White Contender Series, and now he's going to be making his UFC debut. So the people at Subfighter don't fuck around. They are so MMA specific and just like a high testosterone gym of a bunch of MMA killers. So this fight, Eddie Bernal out of Aces Jiu-Jitsu, he is basically utilizing his takedowns and able to get like six or seven takedowns in the first and second round and do a little bit of groundwork. They're not, it's not so damaging, but uh, Chase does get a cut on his head. So I felt like the first two rounds could have went Eddie Bernal's way, but you could have said that the second round went in Chase's direction, which is why when the third round came into play and Chase just had a dominant round, uh, definitely won it, was grounding and pounding Eddie. Eddie seemed like he might've been a little bit tired. Um, and the fight goes to the decision and it goes to a split decision in Eddie Bernal's favor. And you know the crowd is going absolutely wild because the Bernal family and all of their friends are the craziest supporters. Papa Bernal was there and he told me that he sold over like 400 tickets or something like that, which is of no surprise because they used to sell out the true promotion stuff. So this is a great win for Eddie Bernal. You know, winning your professional debut is always nice. Uh, but for Chase Whitmer, he's one and one and he's just going to have to bounce back from this one. It's always tough when you feel like you kind of want to fight, but it doesn't go your way. But that's the name of the game, especially in MMA. You got to get that finish. And then the final fight of the evening the main event was between Anthony Jimenez who came in missing weight this fight was supposed to be for the bantamweight title but obviously since Anthony missed weight he could not be in contention for that and this is against Peyton Talbot who is 3-0 the current champion then of A1 combat and who is still the champion because he had a dominant dominant win and this is the prospect that I say people really have to look out for because he has a cool calm and collective nature to his fighting style uh very cocky in moments almost anderson silva like he punched anthony jimenez so hard that anthony you know sat back on his ass and instead of peyton jumping on him and you know attacking he just looks at him and he's just like it was a great moment. It was very Anderson Silver like, very uh, theatrical. And he, even when he like has him on the fence in those moments, he's talking to him, distracting him, getting in his head. So it's very much a fighter that I can see going all the way, being that um, contender like you have go all the way to the UFC or whatever promotion. But I really feel like he would be a great fit for the UFC. And even he's very tall, so I don't think I don't know if he would stay at 135 forever, but. Um, definitely the prospect to look out for. He had some gnarly elbows coming down on Anthony Jimenez, and I felt so bad because Jimenez's family was there in the stands, and there was like this little girl screaming like, Anthony, get up, Anthony, get up. And she's like 12 years old, and I'm like, this would be so much for me, watching my brother or cousin get absolutely mauled in the cage. Like a lot of the people in the stands were saying, call the fight off, call the fight off. But every time Frank Trigg had a moment of, oh, should I call it off? Anthony Jimenez would show a little fight, show him trying to get out. But at the end of the day, it ended in a TKO win for Peyton Talbot, very dominant everywhere. And he was just able to do the same thing over and over, get him to the cage, pin, um, pin to the ground, and just work in some tough ground and pound there.